this week, the haves and have nots, the West versus the rest. How does climate change feed into inequality? It is not because there is no scientists, scientists in Africa. It is not because they are not interested. It's because of the system in place. E-waste, or how Europe uses West Africa, is a dumping ground for obsolete electronics, endangering nature and people's lives. They have to burn some of these electronics, like the wires. In the wires, you have copper and other materials, so they have to burn them. And a lot of times, a lot of them get actually cancer from it. And from climate leader to environmental offender, back to climate leader again? Brazil's government delivers a green U-turn, and critics raise an eyebrow. From Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York, I'm Kaylee Lines, and this is Bloomberg Green. The U.S. and Europe have the race toward net zero at the top of their agendas, but developing nations are lagging behind. While climate is an issue that concerns all humans, what about those that are left out of the conversation? Data is at the heart of the fight against climate change. Having access to accurate weather forecasts and learning about patterns can inform a better course of action. But while that sort of information is usually ready available for projects in Europe and North America, Africa appears to have a glaring data gap, a gap that could mean that African voices are not heard as loudly as others. Joining us now is Yuba Sakona. He is the vice chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and the IPCC is the body responsible for the landmark UN Climate Report. So Yuba, welcome to Bloomberg Green, and thank you so much for joining us. When we talk about these data gaps, what data specifically are we talking about that is so critically important? As you know, IPCC is assessing the uh, different various information on climate change. It's not conducting its own research. It rely on publication that has been made by, you know, scientists across the world on various aspects related to climate, from the physical science to the impact adaptation and uh, mitigation aspect. And in order to make any publication on those various uh, elements, you need data. It is not only climate data, uh, biophysical data, socioeconomic data, because you need data to produce information and you need information to produce knowledge. Unfortunately, in the African context, and then those are issues that has been for many years uh, critical in order to be uh, fully aware and then to plan different uh, uh, issues related to climate. And why is this data so much harder to get from Africa? Is it an infrastructure issue? Is it a people issue? When the climate became a very important uh, an issue, uh, all the countries, including the Africa, African countries, and then to uh, be aware and then to notice is a critical element, and then the uh, African uh, government through the Africa uh, Development Bank, the African Union Commission, and the United Nations Economic Community Commission for Africa set up the African Climate Policy Center, starting with a Climate for Development Program, CLIMDEV, and then to focus on climate information system. And I had the privilege and then to be the uh, coordinator of that program. And then we try to focus on improving the quality and then improving also the infrastructure mm -hmm. for climate and weather data in order to inform, you know, uh, different policies in the continent related to the climate uh, adaptation programs. And obviously, the IPCC is trying to get more African science and scientists and more data from Africa involved in its climate supports. And you have a program, more than 700 have, uh, African scientists and academics have attended talks and conferences. What difference has their involvement made? How much more have you learned? I think here again, we made a lot of progress. If you look at the history of IPCC, the 30 years history of IPCC. In the beginning, there were very few African scientists involved in it. 
And then more and more, we are getting a large number of African scientists. And there are a number of problems related to that. It is not because there is no scientists, scientists in Africa. It is not because they are not interested. It's because of the system in place. Yuba, when you're compiling the IPCC report, everyone has to agree. You have to get the sign off on it. And I'm wondering if that was made more difficult because of some of these data lapses. Sometimes it creates some misunderstanding of some of the government and then that are not aware of the way IPCC is working. Just an example, in the approval of IPCC Working Group 2 report of the fifth assessment cycle in Japan, Yokohama, and there were a bit some uh, clash between the uh, uh, authors and then the uh, working group two and the African delegates because the delegates wanted to see in the report the issue of drought and desertification. And that could not be prominently in the report for the simple reason there were no scientific literature published on those. As I indicated, IPCC is rely on the publications, not related to different fact people having in mind. They said that drought of desertification is an important issue in Africa. If there's no publication, it cannot be transparent in the IPCC. So those are some of the problems, some of the issues, and then we are sometimes facing. And there is a big need in the upstream activities of IPCC, and then to have a much more proactive and preeminent uh, put for the African, and that means to invest in universities, to invest in research institutions, and then to do research and publication on issues that are specifically for Africa, relevant for the African, and then to have a better understanding of the dynamic of the climate-related uh, issues in the continent. A specific call to action for clearly a crucially important data issue. Thank you so much to Yuba Sakona, who is the vice chair of the IPCC. Up next, leapfrogging. Investing in green technology could solve many problems in poorer nations, but can it create new ones? And e-waste, how the West's discarded goods are becoming an environmental and health hazard in West Africa. This is Bloomberg Green. From Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York, I'm Kaylee Lines, and this is Bloomberg Green. Let's get your weekly check-in on climate news with our Jennifer Zabazaja. I'm Jennifer Zabazaja in New York. Here are all the stories you need to know in green this week. Boris Johnson has suggested the UK won't update its international climate promises next year. The Prime Minister told Parliament Britain's climate goals are ambitious enough. He also hailed the agreement reached at COP26 in Glasgow, saying the summit had kept, quote, alive the ambition to limit global warming first spelled out in the Paris Agreement. Also, European carbon futures have hit new records this week following the deal at COP26 that seeks to reduce the use of fossil fuels. Making polluters pay for carbon permits is seen as a key way to cut emissions in Europe. The EU plans to extend the bloc's trading scheme to more sectors. And finally, New York State's financial regulator has called on insurers to consider climate-related risks in their business planning. The guidance directs insurers based in the state to account for their exposure to rising sea levels and climbing global temperatures. That includes incorporating the dangers posed by climate change into risk management frameworks. And that's your Green Brief. Thanks, Jen. E-waste, that's the obsolete electronics that we don't want anymore. And in Ghana in West Africa, around 85% of imported devices come from the EU. And most of them end up at a scrapyard near the slums of the capital, Accra. Their e-waste piles up and is disassembled by informal workers. Ghanaian artist Ibrahim Mahama shines a light on this issue that's one for the environment and for public health. They have to burn some of these electronic, like the wires. In the wires, you have copper and other materials, so they have to burn them. 
in order to be able to extract those. And sometimes, a lot of times, a lot of them get actually cancer from it. Yeah. E-waste is one of the defining problems of this generation, with often disastrous impacts to public health and the economy. The proposition here is that we live in a waste age. Just as we lived in a Stone Age and a Bronze Age and a Steam Age, we produce so much waste. It's one of the defining materials of our time. So we live in a waste age. The world is on course to see 74 million tonnes of electronic waste a year by 2030. Upwards of 85% of electronics and electrical parts imported into Ghana are from the EU, and most of it ends up in a landfill site in Accra. My name is Ibrahim Mahama. I'm a visual artist from Ghana, and I have basically been interested in this idea of material history and culture. The work at the Design Museum is titled Fadama 40, and basically it gets its name from this area in Accra called Old Fadama which uh, predominantly they have this uh, e-waste site there, which is like supposed to be the largest e-waste site in Africa. And a lot of like the e-waste that gets there are actually electronics, which are supposed to be recycled in Europe, but they end up in Africa and other parts of the world anyway, because um, the European countries, they would rather export their waste to other countries than process them in Europe. There are videos which I've made where when drone footage where you look at a crab and then it's all like covered in this cloud of like smoke. Ibrahim Mohammed's work features a wall of old television sets that plays clips from a landfill site in Ghana. It illustrates the remnants of electronic waste generated and shows that e-waste is not a gold mine. It's a global mess. Environmental degradation, pollution, global climate shifts. It's also about us uh, spending more time to understand our footprint in terms of the world, the products that we buy, the longevity of those products, because a lot of the things we've been actually, over the years, educated to be able to buy things and buy again and again and again. But the blame does not only lie with the consumer. When I say we, you might think I mean consumers. Um, I don't really. I mean, of course, it's a societal problem and corporations have been very good at uh, suggesting that consumers have the responsibility. But in fact, consumers have very few good choices to make when it comes to things like waste and packaging and recycling. Those systems are not really fit for purpose. So I think the responsibility really lies upstream with manufacturers, with industry, with uh, legislators. If you think about a product, most waste happens before that product even reaches the store. It's happened during the extraction process or the manufacturing process. We tend to think of waste as something that happens after the consumer's disposed of it, which is an issue. But in fact, in terms of volume of waste, it's all happening earlier. We need to make a transition from an economy that relies on uh, fossil fuels and extractivism it relies on steel and concrete and plastic, um, to one that relies on growing materials. Between 2014 and 2019, there has been a 21% jump in the levels of e-waste generated. This has had large repercussions on the inequality within the supply chain and is something we must confront preservation of the object it allows you to be able to look deeper into the politics of it because the artist has been able to for instance create a shift within the position of the object whereas in like old Fadama it's almost like an erasure of time and history and memory. There is hope but the solution may not lie in the commercial markets. I'm not too worried about people who come and say well what's the industrial potential of that how big can it be because actually um, industrial scale is part of the problem that we're dealing with. I think it shows that we're, we're in the change, the change is happening. It demonstrates to people that, it, that it's not hopeless and actually we're creating a different future as we speak. Investing in green technology is often portrayed as the holy grail to rid the world of unsustainable and energy intensive practices. But before the West had solar panels, it had coal-fired power stations. Developing nations are being asked to skip that stage. It sounds good in principle, but in practice, it's asking someone who just picked up a tennis racket to play Wimbledon. Just like mastering a sport, what's missing is time and money. In many cases, infrastructure is lacking and costs are prohibitive. We look deeper into that concept of leapfrogging.
I'm for making sure we continue with fusion, we continue here. We're pouring our efforts into research across international lines, and I am confident, yes, that we can get there. Human beings created this problem, human beings can solve it. The climate crisis is a global one. Governments, think tanks and advocacy groups have now realised that it's not only an ecological disaster, but one that could have serious consequences for economic growth and development. The current debate between developed and developing nations dates back to the Industrial Revolution. Emerging economies now argue that richer nations have been able to develop because of their ability to use dirty energy. So why can't they? It's very sad that the, the least developed countries are the victims of climate change more than the ones that cause it. Environmental leapfrogging refers to the idea that industrialising or latecomer countries can bypass the dirty stages of economic growth through the use of modern technologies that use fewer resources or generate less pollution. If you look at poor countries in development, for instance, we would like to help them with serious money to simply jump the entire fossil age and go straight into the future. Why don't we you know, leapfrog and, and, and don't be locked into a, a fossil economy that rich countries are now eventually leaving. But there are mixed views on the effectiveness of leapfrogging. We seem to be bringing in newer and newer demands, particularly on emerging economies. Even those who have clearly shown that we didn't wait for global finances, we didn't wait for global technologies, we didn't wait for the world to come and tell us to set up uh, you know, varied uh, sources of renewable energy. And we are moving in that direction. I just think it's a fantastic opportunity to be clean from the start, <laughs> instead of having to go back and transition afterwards. We want to go green, we want to go clean, but it has to be done with our economic development plans. At the end of the day, you know, this vicious cycle of aid all the time is what the less developing countries want to avoid. Like, give us enough money to develop on our own. Leapfrogging isn't cheap. The African Group of Negotiators on Climate Change want $1.3 trillion a year. This is to help the continent make the green transition and protect their economies from the worst impacts of global warming. Funding and financing is critical, and we're hoping that this year takes that turn to have proper money and proper investment into a clean energy transition in line with Paris. At COP26, rich nations pledged to provide $8.5 billion to help South Africa reduce its dependence on coal. ESCOM, the country's state-owned power utility, welcomed this news. ESCOM will need between 30 and $35 billion to make this uh, energy transition a just one and also for us to invest in all the various component parts of our business to make the transition from coal to uh, a lower carbon footprint. But the important contribution is going to come from uh, governments and developmental financing institutions to help us with concessional lending so that we can accelerate this energy transition and decarbonize our economy faster. The announcement that was made um, to support South Africa, which is the largest pollutant in Africa, with 8.5 billion from the UK, France, the US, the EU, again, huge steps going forward. But would that be enough to help in the race towards net zero? You know, we're still living in a world where, you know, the gamers in California use the same amount of energy as the country of Senegal. 138 developing countries put language in the text yesterday. It got removed overnight. It's not there anymore. It's been replaced by an offer for a dialogue. That's all they want to do, a dialogue. Disappointing? Absolutely disappointing and totally unacceptable. Does that make unacceptable. this whole agreement a failure? Sorry? Does this make this whole agreement a failure? As far as I'm concerned, it is a failure. Coming up, from climate leader to environmental offender to climate leader again. Up next, we analyze Brazil's green promises. This is Bloomberg Green. History has been made here in Glasgow. My delight at this progress is tinged with disappointment. The reality is that what has happened here is very significant. Is it everything everybody wanted in every place? No. 
come here with a single agenda, which is to help the poorest people on the planet who are already suffering from the impacts of human-induced climate change. And we needed a Glasgow facility on loss and damage finance here. 138 developing countries put language in the text yesterday. It got removed overnight. It's not there anymore. It's been replaced by an offer for a dialogue. That's all they want to do, a dialogue. Disappointing? Absolutely disappointing and totally unacceptable. Brazil, a global climate leader turned environmental offender under President Jair Bolsonaro, approached this year's COP summit ready to prove that it was changing course. In Glasgow, his government committed to cutting carbon emissions in half by 2030, achieving carbon neutrality by 2050, and ending illegal deforestation by 2028. Yet environmentalists and political opponents in Brazil were quick to poke holes in the announcements. And whatever Brazil does matters, as the South American nation is home to the majority of the world's largest and most diverse rainforest, the Amazon. We analyze Brazil's climate turnaround. Brazil's government says it's working to stop deforestation. But behind the scenes, it's actively engaged in a campaign to privatize and develop the Amazon. The Brazilian government in the 70s and 80s, they had this big campaign to drive folks, millions of folks into the Amazon promising land for them. This is a conversation not just about the burning of the Amazon, but there's a, it's a very complex situation and a lot of it is about land governance. The people who are doing the deforestation, they're not necessarily terrible people, but they're in a situation where the government is has encouraged deforestation in a lot of ways because they have no other sort of options in life. You know, they don't have education. They don't have any other way to be making money or feeding their family. And a lot of the poor Brazilians have been turned into sort of foot soldiers to clear this land that eventually ends up into industrial uh, farming operations. it for this week's edition of Bloomberg Green, and you can keep the conversation on inequality going. You can follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter at Climate. I'm Kaylee Lines from Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York, and this is Bloomberg Green.